good morning. Welcome to River Tree. I want to say a special welcome to our online audience. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. We're glad that you are here. Everybody who's gathered with us here on Lansing Ave in Jackson, we want to thank you for being here. Uh, we've, we've learned, we've got people in our online audience that we didn't even know were there. So last week we, we did life together here in this space. We did an interactive life together where we had people sharing things. And, uh, and I learned we had a, a woman from Florida that's been inter- engaging with us. And so if you are there this morning down in Florida, I hope it is warm and beautiful. It is supposed to get warmer, but it is actually kind of rainy and, and foggy here in Michigan today. So... Uh, Thank you so much for being here. I do want to talk about a couple of very quick things that we have going on this week and actually today. So today there are two opportunities after we get done with the gathering. The first is a citywide prayer walk. We are going to be a part of a citywide prayer walk where we, ever, churches in the, in the city of Jackson have split up all of the streets in the city of Jackson and we're going to try to make sure we pray over all of the streets in the city of Jackson. And so we have about a four or five block area that is ours to pray over. And so we're, we're going to have people that are going to be gathering down by the, uh, the health department at 1230 this afternoon and are then going to walk those, those blocks. And so the health department, if you get on Lansing Ave, you go out of our parking lot, take a left, go over the highway, just over the highway on your left, you'll see some buildings there and you can park in that parking lot. And then we're going to be crossing the street and praying over those streets there. So would love for you to join us for the prayer walk. Again, that'll be today at 1230. The other thing is River Tree Connect. If you're new to River Tree, new-ish to River Tree, and you want a chance to get to know us a little bit better, want to learn a little bit more about us, we would love to be able to have lunch with you. So uh, you might not have signed up. That's okay. We've got some extra. We're having pizza this time. We've got some extra pizza coming. So we would love for you to join us. Uh, 12 th- or sorry, not at 12.30, but that'll be right after this gathering. Give us a few minutes to set up tables and things like that. But uh, we're going to hang out and have some fun today. The other things that are going on you've got in your current here, if you're here in person, if you're online, a couple of other things to write down two weeks from now are our baptisms. We're going, to be do, we're going to be doing baptisms on May 15th. If you would like to be baptized on that day, you can head to our website to rivertree.church slash register. Make sure you add that slash register, and that will get you to our registration page. We use that page for registering for all sorts of things, and if you go there right now, you'll be able to register for the baptisms. Register there. We'll get you the information you need. Again, that's going to be two Sundays from now. If you're wondering what we baptize people in, if you happen to be here in person, you can go to the end of the kids' own hallway, and you're going to see the horse trough, and that is exactly what we baptize you in, is that big blue horse trough. We promise you that we bought it brand new. It was never used for horses. So that is, that is a guarantee. Came straight from Napoleon Feed Mill to us, all right? And we didn't have to, like, wash any horse snot out of it. So we would love to baptize you. Uh, the other two things that are in your current, one is food for kids. Our last day for packing food, packing food for food for kids, which is our ministry that helps provide food for kids at Da Vinci schools that might go hungry over the weekend, uh, is on May 10th. That is on a Tuesday at 4 p.m., and that happens in what we call the garage. And the garage is the building that is right next to this building. That is, if you go in our parking lot, go past this building, and there's a little, a little red building there. We call that the garage, and that is where they pack the food. The other thing is the save the date for the Jackson Hot Air Jubilee. That is going to be July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And if you're new here, you might go, well, why in the world are they advertising this community event in Jackson, and why, why would they be doing it so early? So we have, over the last 10 years, had the privilege of being able to help out at the Jubilee, and we have a big tent we call the Kids' Kingdom, and it's, it's a tent full of carnival-style games. It's a lot of fun. It's a great way for us to connect with the community. So we have over 1,000 kids that come through, and we get to bless them with some fun stuff to do for free, which parents love because a lot of other stuff costs money. They get to engage with it for free. We get the opportunity opportunity to just give them a positive experience with with River Tree in specific and the church as a whole. So we need people. As you're planning your Sunday vacations, as your Sunday times away, you can take any weekend you want and go to the campground except that weekend, all right? Any other weekend and I'm going to show up at the campground and knock on your trailer door and like kidnap you and bring you down to the Jubilee. That'd be really creepy if I did that. Okay. I might not do that, but I, yes, please be thinking about it. Next week, we're going to start sign-ups because it takes all hands to be able to make that happen, and I appreciate all of you that help us with that. On that note, I'm going to turn things over to our worship team. We are so excited to worship with you today as we go before the throne of God. 
and just worship him and his forgiveness and his greatness today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. God, we pray that you would meet with us here. Pray that your spirit would move through this place. We give you all the praise and glory in your name. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us. Oh, 
Perfect in all of 
of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. you to take a moment and ask God to speak to you this morning. And then take a moment of silence and allow the Holy Spirit room to speak to you today. Father, I pray that you would answer those prayers. Lord, that is, we make ourselves available to you, that you would speak to us, that you would change us, that you would shape us and mold us. Help us to listen. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, if you want to head to Kids Zone, now would be the time to make your way there. And I'm not seeing one of our kids' own teachers. Usually we've got a teacher who is ready to, to help lead them where they need to go. I think Amber will help. Amber will guide the way there. Thank you, Amber. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, we're going to lead. A, I'll just have a herd of kids running down the hallway on their own here. Okay. While they're going, I wanted to touch base on two quick things while I go ahead and move this. The first is that I missed one announcement at the beginning, 
and we have a group of people that help provide snacks on Sunday mornings. And we just need to, first of all, give a round of applause to everybody who helps provide snacks on Sunday mornings. Can I get an amen? Yes. But we need some more people to help provide snacks on Sunday mornings. So there is a sign-up sheet on the, the, the table in the back of this room. And uh, if you'd be interested in bringing some kind of something to share with the, with the crew, we would love it if you'd be willing to do that maybe once a month or so. Uh, just help us. We think it, it, it helps provide an environment where people feel welcome, and that's important. So uh, you, if you'd be willing to do that, you can sign up back there. The other thing that I didn't mention at the beginning is these water bottles. So if you're new here this morning, and I know I've gotten a chance to touch base with some of you, but I want to thank all of you that are new or new-ish to River Tree. We would love to get one of these into your hands. So they are available uh, in the foyer. Usually they're 10 bucks, but if you're new, they're free. Uh, we just ask that you fill out an info card. So there's info cards that are back by the, that are, that are in the foyer, that are sitting by the water bottles. And feel free to just, you can, you can uh, self-serve if you want to. You can fill out that card, leave it right there, grab a water bottle. And uh, we want to th just thank you so much for being here this morning. So I want to start, and I know this, this, this story is going to be a hard way to start. I'm just warning you up front. I'm going to tell the story very briefly of a guy named John. And John's not his real name. We're just going to, we're going to use the name John for him this morning. You'll understand as we talk through the story why I'd, be, I'd give him a, a pseudonym. So I met John quite a few years ago now. We're probably talking 17 or 18 years ago now. I was a youth pastor at Trinity Wesleyan Church here in Jackson. And John uh, had just gotten out of prison. He'd spent about seven years in prison. And there's a man at, at Trinity that had a ministry in the uh, prison ministry, did a fantastic job of getting to know people, of helping, helping prisoners as they were coming out of prison to readjust to life in society, help them find jobs, help them find housing, all of those things. And I got to meet John when he was in that season. He had just gotten out and was, was getting his life moving again. And I went over and I was hanging out at the place where John was staying and was getting to know him and he started to tell me his story. And his story started pretty normal. He had been, had a normal life growing up and was living a relatively normal life before he ended up in prison. He was a single guy who uh, worked and hung out with his friends and just did normal single guy stuff. And then one particular evening, he and some of his buddies had had a little too much to drink and he, he didn't he didn't go and drive after that, but he, he slept in. He, he, slept, he slept past his alarm and ended up late for work. And so he hopped on his motorcycle and he lived back on a bunch of country roads and he took off and he was trying to make up for lost time. And so he was going about 80 miles an hour down these, down these, down these, these country roads and just absolutely flying and he crested a hill and there on the other side of the hill was a mother with a little girl pushing a stroller. It was right in his path. And he laid the bike down. He tried to avoid them as best he could. He ended up, uh, his, his arm was permanently damaged in the process. When I met him, he had no use of his right arm. Uh, but the bike still plowed into them and killed the mother. And when I met with John, he was telling me the story. And he finished the story. And he looked at me and he said, can God forgive me? Can God forgive me? John had a monkey on his back. Not to make light of what he was going through because it was absolutely tragic and hard and he was wrestling with some things. And I want to give you, uh, later on, I want to give you my answer that I gave to John. But we are in this series called Five Monkeys. And I introduced them last week. I'm going to go ahead and reintroduce them this week just so that we, we know who these monkeys are that are on stage with me this morning. So this, this particular monkey here, this is our expectations. So we all had an idea of what we thought life was going to look like of where we would be at in this particular season of life. And sometimes that plays out the way you thought it would, and sometimes it doesn't. So maybe, you, maybe you thought that you would be married, and you're not married. Maybe you thought that you'd be single, and you are married. Maybe you thought that you would complete a certain amount of education. Maybe you thought that you'd have a certain job, and life doesn't always play out the way that we think it's going to. And so our expectations of ourselves end up playing into how we live life. Last week, we introduced you to this monkey here, and this monkey here was the expectations of others. 
of maybe words that have been said about you, things that have been said about you that have sunk in and that had weighed on your heart and your soul. And I asked you last week to leave some of those things here on this monkey. I just want to read a few of them to you this morning. These were words that people have had said to them or things that that had been spoken about them that had sunk in. The words like unloved, too fat, not enough, unworthy, not strong enough. Anxious, worthless. And my hope is that as you left some of these here last week, that you were able to leave them here. We talked about this just briefly. Monkeys have a tendency when you pry them off of your back to hop back on. We have a We have over here, we have the money monkey. And I just need to point this out, Bill, because I think it was absolutely fantastic. I don't know if you noticed that Bill, our keyboardist this morning, was wearing this monkey's hat. He was, he was, he's he's sitting there playing and I'm like looking at him, looking at the monkey, looking at him, I'm like, this is amazing. So I, I love that hat on Bill and it just, it matched the money monkey. So the money monkey is the things that we spent our money on yesterday of impact today and the things we spend our money on today impact tomorrow. And sometimes it can be really hard to overcome the money monkey. We're going to talk about the money monkey next week. Down here on the, uh, the far end, we have the monkey of self-doubt. And sometimes what this monkey, where this monkey is coming from is all of these other monkeys combined, but they combine into a negative self-narrative that we have inside of our heads that keep us from becoming who God would want us to become. This morning, though, we're looking at this guy. This is the monkey of past mistakes because we've all got them. We've all done things in our past that we wish we could take back, said things that we wish we hadn't said. And what do we do with that? This isn't particular to any one person. In fact, I think that just about all of us, actually, I would say that all of us have things that we wish we hadn't done. And what do we do with that? How do we wrestle that to the ground? And we're going to spend some time, we're going to spend some time working through this today. We're going to be headed to Romans chapter 7. If you want to start to head there, you can. Uh, The scripture is going to be up here on the screen. If you need a Bible and you're here with us in person, feel free to grab one on the table in the back. We would love to. Uh, we would love for you to take one with you. We want to make sure that God's word is available to you. If you're gathered with us online and you don't have a Bible, please reach out. So my email address is Andy at Rivertree Church. That's my personal email address, Andy at Rivertree Church. If you send me your name and your address, we'll make sure that we get a Bible in your hands because we really do believe that God's word is living and active and impacts our lives. And we need to make it a part of our lives. So I want to help you do that. Romans chapter 7 is where we're going to be headed. But as we dive into this, we need to name something here. Because let's be honest, we use the word mistake in two different ways. Well, we use the name, the word mistake for two different things. On this hand, let's talk about things that we do when we're trying to do the right thing or just trying to do the normal thing. You're at work, you're doing your job, whatever that is, and you accidentally do something. You send, you send an order to the wrong place. You, you put, uh, you, maybe you're a teacher and you're grading, you're put, you're grading papers and you put uh, one student's grade in another student's uh, box in the, uh, in, the, in the program. Whatever it is, must, there are mistakes, those things that we make that we're just, we're trying to do the normal thing. You're, you're mowing the lawn and you didn't see the rock that, that it ended up in your yard and you end up mowing over the thing and it ends up messing up your mower. Those honest mistakes that are just a part of life. We use the word mistake to talk about those. The other thing, though, are those things that we do that we realize we shouldn't have done when we make the choice to do the thing that we probably shouldn't have done. And afterwards, as we look back on it, we, the same, we would use the same word. In fact, I've used that, that word this way in this introduction as we've started talking about this, this idea that I have made mistakes in my past that I wish I hadn't made. And we need, to, we need to own the fact that these, while we use the same word mistake, these are two different categories of things. And I think sometimes we like to use the word mistake for this side of things because it lets us off the hook. We feel a little less guilty about them because we just say, oh, I made a mistake. And we need to take a minute and own our mistakes. I'm not a a huge tennis fan. 
So some of you in this room who may be, you can, you can feel free to, to, to correct me later if you want to. I read a story not too long ago about John McEnroe, who was a famous tennis player, who now, now is uh, an announcer for tennis, and you may have seen, seen his face on the, on the TV when you're flipping through. Maybe you love tennis and you watch it and you, you hear him announcing. Here's the thing. John McEnroe, when he first started his career, was known as an absolute jerk. In fact, this, is, this was a sentence that was written about him when he first started. This was written in 1979 about John McEnroe when he was 20 years old. It says this. It says, he is the most vain, ill-tempered, petulant loudmouth that the game of tennis has ever known. <laughs> like, Oh, that's an awesome sentence. Can we just be honest? Like, I, whoever wrote that sentence needs, needs a pat on the back. First of all, the word petulant, I think we just need to use more because it's fun to read. Vain, ill-tempered, loud, petulant, loudmouth, the game of tennis has ever known. So what happens in life is that when our charisma or our competence outpaces our character, we're set up, we, we get set up for disaster. When, you're, when your charisma or your competence outpaces your character, it's a recipe for disaster. And you've probably seen this happen. We see this happen in very public ways when, when people rise to, the, rise to the top very quickly and their, their charisma outpaces their character and usually there's, there's a fall that's coming. We see this in, in our workplaces sometimes. Maybe you, there, there's that person where you're like, man, I don't think they're really as good as they, they, they think they are. They're, maybe their charisma, maybe their maybe they're competence, maybe they really are that good, but their character isn't there, so they end up coming across as an absolute jerk. When our competence or our charisma outpaces our character, we're in trouble. And that seems to be what happened to John McEnroe. Something that he struggled to do was to own his losses. When he would lose a match, he would always have an excuse for why he lost the match. It was never him. It was never, it was never uh, I, you know, the other person was better than I was, or I just, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't practice enough this week. I was reading a book recently called Mindset that talks, that talks about John McEnroe in this way, and this is a list of things that... John McEnroe gave reasons he gave, excuses he gave after he lost matches. So these were, these were some of the reasons. One time he lost a match because he had a fever. One time he had a backache. One time he fell victim to expectations. Another time to the tabloids. One time he lost to a friend because the friend was in love and he wasn't. One time he ate too close to the match. One time he was too chunky. One time he was too thin. One time it was too cold, another time too hot. One time he was undertrained, another time he overtrained. <laughs> he didn't want to own the loss. And as we talk about these mistakes, this group of mistakes over here, something that's important is that we need to be willing to own them and to name them for what they are. Because if we're going to get rid of the monkey of these past mistakes, we have to start by, by, by owning them. And the, the word that Scripture uses for these things is sin. And that's not a word that's popular today. It's a word that, that people wrestle with. But I want us to spend a few minutes wrestling with this idea of sin, unpacking what is sin, and then how do we get this monkey off of our backs if you feel like this monkey is on your back. So let's read Romans chapter 7, starting with verse 21. I have discovered this principle in life, that when, what, when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of that sin that leads to death. I want to hop down now to verse 12, where we've moved from chapter 7 now to chapter 8. Verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
Let's spend a minute and, and define sin. Talk about where it comes from. The, the word sin in the New Testament is the Greek word hamartia. And hamartia, there, there's different ways that you can, you, can, you can use that word to help us understand what's meant by it. But one of the simple ones that I think is helpful to me is the concept of missing the mark. Missing the mark, it's a word picture of an archer who's, who's aimed at a target and pulls that arrow back, takes aim, lets go, and misses. This is me whenever I try to use a bow and arrow, by the way. Take me to a rifle range, I love it, that I'll have a ball. You put a bow and arrow in my hands and I am just going to be frustrated and so is your neighbor because my arrows are going to be in their yard rather than in the hay bale that I'm aiming for. I'm going to pull that thing back, I'm going to take aim and I'm going to let go and it's not going to go where I want it to go. That's missing the mark. So what's the mark is the question. Well, the mark is God's desire and his design for us. Then in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we have God creating humanity. He makes us in his image. He designs us for relationship with him and relationship with each other. And he has this design for us. And in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the picture. Adam and Eve miss the mark. They do other than what God wants them to do. And they break that relationship. And what happens then is every human being since Genesis 3 on is born with what we call a sinful nature. Paul talked about this in, uh, let, me, let me get there, verse 25. He said this, he said, so you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my, what, my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. One of the ways that helps me picture the sinful nature, and this is going to date me because this will this'll let you know how, how old I am. Some of you in this room will remember this commercial, and some of you won't, okay? If you are too young to remember this commercial, just be nice, okay? I'm, I'm, I understand how old I am. There were these old V8 commercials back in the day, and there were people that would walk around bent like this in the commercials. Lisa remembers. She's smiling. She gets it. And they would walk around, and the reason why, why they were walking this way is they hadn't had enough nutrients, and they just needed a V8. And if they drank a V8, they would, oh, they would stand upright. And that's the, that picture in my mind helps me picture the idea of a sinful nature, that if there is a right and a wrong, we're, bent with the, we're, we're born with this bent this way. And if you don't believe me, take a look at a room full of four-year-olds. You don't need to teach them how to be selfish. You need to teach them how to share their toys. It's not that they all start out altruistic and, oh, here, let, uh, here's my teddy bear. Why don't you use my teddy bear? I want you to have my teddy bear. No, like, like they're grabbing each other, stuff from each other and hitting each, each other over the head. They, like, we're, we're born with that. This isn't, something that is, this isn't something that is just you. And here's the thing. This is a... This is, this is a, this is a diagram that I draw on a somewhat regular basis here because I think it helps us wrestle with some it helps us wrestle with some very deep things in a very simple way. And so if you, you hang around River Tree long enough you'll see this on a pretty regular basis. So let's picture this this piece of paper is it represents everybody in the world and you could put a dot for every person in the world that would represent their distance from God. Now, every analogy breaks down in one way, shape, or form, and where this breaks down is that God is never distant from us. We need to understand that. God is always with us, but I think we also have this understanding that I, that I, have, I have road that I need to travel, that I have places I need to improve in. So you would say, Maybe you'd say, you know what, I've, I, am, I am really close to God. Maybe you'd say, I'm really far away from God. Maybe you're here, and even the idea that there is a God is something that you're still kicking around. And so you, so you would say, I don't even know if this is a valid example. And I appreciate that honesty. Like, we want this to be a space where you can explore this, this idea that there is a God who loves you. Maybe you would say, maybe you would say, you know what, I, I think that there's a God, but I, I, I think I'm so far away, I'm not even on the piece of paper. Maybe you'd say, I'm right here, but we could, we could take and we could put a, a, a dot on here for every human being in the world. We won't take the time to do that, by the way. Don't worry. I'm... So everybody has a distance and everybody has a direction. There's a difference. Your, the, your distance would be from here to here or here to here. Your direction is what way you're moving. So... This person here may be a ways away, but maybe they really are in a season where they are moving towards God. 
to being very intentional about that. Maybe you've got a person here who's been close to God, but for whatever reason in this season is walking away from him. We have a distance and a direction. When we start talking about sin, a place that the church finds itself in is we find ourselves in a place where as far as the culture around us, the idea and concept of sin is a foreign concept. And so what we find ourselves in is we find ourselves in a place of being countercultural right now. And that's fine. But I want us to understand why that is because I think sometimes it feels like we're talking two different languages and having two different conversations. And I think that it, it hinges on a single question. And I think that if you wrestle this question to the ground, it will help you understand both for yourself what this, what this process looks like, and it will also maybe help you then also understand some of the other conversations that go on in culture. And here is the question, is where on this chart are you the most human? Where in this chart are you the most human? Is this person here who would say, in the, who would say let's say before, before, they, they made, before they started heading that direction, before they came to, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, would they be the most human? Are they in their most human state right then? Or is this person the most human? How you answer that question will determine how you approach all of the rest of this conversation. And here's why. Genesis chapters one and two, God's desire and his design. God creates humans. And a whole human is that, is that human in Genesis 1 and 2, is that Adam and Eve human that is in that relationship with God that is living in that desire and that design. That hum, what gets broken in Genesis 3 is Humanity. And so the story of the gospel, the, the, the story of the message of Jesus Christ is that, that we are most human when we get, when we get to hear. That, that God sent Jesus to this earth to die for us so that we could be restored into relationship with God, so that we could become more of who God wanted us to be, not less of who God wanted us to be. The reason that this conversa the conversation is so hard that today is because the, the, the narrative that, that most people have is that I am most human here, that what I need to do is I need to discover my truth and I need to live my truth, that I'm most human when I am over here. The message of the gospel is that, over, that this is broken and that we all are broken. When are you most human? We need to own, here's, uh, so how do, what do we do about it? <laughs> you say, this is all great, Andy. You spent a whole lot of time building, building this up, but we haven't gotten to anything about getting the monkey off of our backs yet. So I want to I wanna process a little bit of this. I think we need to start by owning that the problem is in the room. The problem is in the room, and here's what I mean by this. I read a book a while ago called Necessary Endings by a man named Henry Cloud, and in that book, he talks about coaching. He was coaching an employer who was having trouble coaching one of their employees. And the, the employer said, I, whenever I meet with them, I can't seem to get them to move forward. I'll give them, I'll give them things that they need to be working on. I'll give them tasks. I'll give them measurables. And then they all, I come back, and they've, ne they've never done them, and they always obfuscate. They always have excuses. They always have a reason why they haven't done the thing. And so Henry Cloud said, I went into this meeting with this employer and the employee and just observed one of these, one of these times together, and the guy did. Every time, every time the employer brought up the, the thing that the employee said they would do, the employee had an excuse, a reason why they hadn't done the thing. And when they left, Henry Cloud said, I looked at the employer and he said, I can see why it, this is so hard. He said, because with this employee, the problem is never in the room. In other words, they always, they wanted to see everything else as the problem, but never themselves. And if we're going to get this monkey off of our back, we need to own the fact that the problem is inside of us. We need to let go of all of our excuses all of the reasons why that, that, I, that I let myself off the hook and own this. In the passage that we read earlier, Romans, Romans 7.23 says, but there's another power 
within me that is at war with my mind. Another power that is where? Within me. That is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. The next verse says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Paul's really making us feel good about ourselves, isn't he? <laughs> like, like, what a miserable person I am. Who will free from me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? The, the words that are translated here, dominated by sin and death, this is really gross. This is a gross word picture. So if you're grossed out easily, I apologize. I'm going to say it anyway. So the, the, he says, he said, uh, dominated by sin and death. The Greek words there, the Greek phrase is, is dominated by this body of death. And that phrase body of death is actually referring to an ancient Roman punishment for murder. That one of the things that judges could do if you were convicted of murder is that they could have a dead body tied to you. And you would have to walk around with that body tied to you. As best you could. I mean, like, that's going to be super heavy. But here was the thing. You were not allowed to be let, let loose from that. So if anyone tried to let you loose from it, you could, those people could be executed. And you had to carry this around with you. And what would happen is as that body decomposed, the bacteria from the decomposing dead body would enter into the, the healthy body of the murderer. And eventually, that person would get sick and die as well. It was a death sentence. And a really gross one at that. But that's the word picture that Paul uses to talk about sin. He says, he uses this, this picture of it being this literally not a monkey on your back, but a dead corpse on your back that you're carrying around with you. That's a really fun mental picture for like early on a Sunday morning. You're like, I just had a cookie and a coffee, Andy. This is not, not where I really wanted to head this morning. I get it. But we've got to be, we've got to get rid of this body of death. Paul does get to the good part. He gets to the redemptive part. Verse 25 says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. What does it look like to put that into practice? That's a lot of words. Very briefly, start by asking God for forgiveness. That might sound overly simplistic, but if you want to get the, the monkey of past mistakes off of your back, we've got to start by asking God to forgive us. Maybe there is one really big thing that, that has haunted you, that you wish was different about your past, about your story. Maybe you thought that it was unforgivable. I told you I would circle back to our, our buddy John at the very beginning of the story, the man who had killed the, killed the woman while he, was dri while he was riding his motorcycle. And I was able to look him in the eye when he asked me, he said, can God forgive me and say yes? And I look you in the eye and I say the same thing that I said to John. There's nothing that you've done that is beyond the redemption of God. And so we need to start by asking him. Second thing, he was, you may need to ask some other people for forgiveness. Maybe whatever put that monkey on your back was something that you did that hurt somebody else. And you need to make a phone call and have a tough conversation. But if you really want to have freedom from that monkey of past mistakes off of your back, and maybe that mistake was something that, that involved somebody else and someone else was hurt in that process, we've got to be willing to take that step. And that's hard. They might not receive it. But that doesn't mean that we don't do it. Then we come to this one, and that is that we need to be willing to receive that forgiveness. In our Headwater class this last Wednesday, we, we were looking at this idea of forgiveness, and I was reminded of these scriptures in Psalm. It says that God takes our sins and throws them as far away from the east as from the west. 
And I love that mental picture because that's an infinite line. You head north and eventually you're gonna start heading south, but if you start heading east, you're just gonna keep going east. You never get to a place where you're headed west. That's the promise. That's how far God says he throws our sins from us. He says if we, if we later in scripture, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Another place says that he remembers our sins no more. We have all of these promises, but let's just be honest, we have trouble believing them. I think, well, you, Aunt, Pastor, you don't know what I did. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We have to be willing to allow God to forgive us. When I, when I talk about this idea, I have to come to one of my favorite stories from my not really my childhood, but my young adult years. And so if you've been around River Tree, you've probably heard this story before, but I don't apologize because I love the story, and so I bring it back up whenever I get the chance. Uh, when, we were, when I was in college, we had a little dog named Blizzard who was a, a schnauzer that was a rescue. A friend of ours had found her in a snowstorm, and we ended up taking her in, and she was, she was deaf and half-blind, and she was one of those dogs that because she was deaf and half-blind didn't notice you were in the room until you'd already been in the room for 20 minutes. You'd get in the room, you'd be doing your thing, and all of a sudden, Blizzard would hop up and go, rawr, 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 rawr. It's like, and for, it'd give you a heart attack because you wouldn't see it coming, and you'd look at the dog and say, I've been here. Like, I've, I've, I've been here the whole time, and I live here with you. Like, like we, 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 we live here together. But that was, that was Blizzard. Bl another quirk that Blizzard has, had was that if my mom didn't get up early enough to let Blizzard out, Blizzard would poop in the hallway outside of my mom's bedroom door. And it kind of drove my mom a little nuts. So being the very good college-age son that I was, I went to the store and bought a pile of fake, fake dog poop. And I got up early one morning and I put the fake dog poop in the hallway outside of my mom's bedroom door. And I sat down and I'm eating my cereal. And my dad got up and here, I, I claim my dad is a co-conspirator in this now because he went, woke up, he walked out the door, he came out to the table and he said, did you put that there? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and so he sat down with me. He could have gone and warned his wife, but he didn't. So now I think he's as guilty as I am by association in this. And so we just sat and waited for my mom. She got up and I heard her go, oh no. She grabbed Blizzard, drug Blizzard over to the fake dog poop, stuck Blizzard's snout in it and said, no, no, bad dog. Took Blizzard outside. She gets back inside and I am dying. I am rolling. And she looks at me, she says, it is not funny. And so I walked up over to the fake poop. I picked it up and I threw it at her. <laughs> Many of you in this room know my mom. She's, she, she's a wonderful, amazing woman, very even keel. This is one of the last times that I remember her being legitimately mad at me. And she was like mad at me that day. She walked around the house going, how do I apologize to a deaf dog? <laughs> which I laughed at even harder, which I shouldn't have. I get it. I'm a horrible human being. It was hilarious. Okay. God has forgiven your sins. What Satan wants to do is to drag you back over to them by the scruff of your neck and stick your nose in them. Say, look at what you did. God can't love you. God couldn't use you. You'll never get over this. And it's a fake pile of poop. The poop is fake. It's gone. God has already said, I've thrown it as far away as the east is from the west. I've forgiven their sins and remember them no more. It's gone. It's a fake pile of poop. But yet we let the enemy drag us over to it, shove our nose in it, and we feel guilty about it again and again and again and again and again. It's a monkey on our backs. We've got to be willing to receive that forgiveness. Internalize that forgiveness. Not let Satan drag us over to a pile of fake dog poop and sh shove our snout in it and tell us how bad we are. Another thing that we can do is we can confess to other people. Now, this isn't about sharing your junk with everybody that you come in contact with. But I want to read this to you. This is James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There is power in confessing to another human being. 
In fact, a way to look at it is as, as you read through scripture, we confess to God for forgiveness. We confess to each other for healing. There's something very healing inside of our spirits that happens when we, when we allow others to understand where we've been. And so it may be that a part of your journey of healing, a part of your journey of peeling this monkey off of your back, if you've tried lots of other things, maybe you need to, to find somebody who loves you, who loves Jesus, that you can have just a really honest conversation with and say, hey, I need you to know this is something I've been struggling with. Or, hey, I need you to know this was a part of my story, and I just feel like I need to confess this to somebody. And you can pray together, and there is, a, there is healing that takes place in that moment. And then we need to be, the last thing is we need to receive redemption. Chapter 8, verse 2 said, Because you belong to him, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And when you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and empowers you to be a part of God's mission and begins to set right all of the broken, brings healing to the broken, enables change in your life that you didn't think was possible. It allows you to become more human, to become that person that God desires and designs you to be. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. We need to allow God the spirit, God's spirit, the space in our lives to bring about change. I've asked Derek if he could come up and just uh, strum on the guitar for a little bit for us. I think he's here. Is he not in the space? I don't see Derek. I've asked Bill to come up and play on the keyboard for us a little bit. And can we just one more time, can we look at the, 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 the resemblance here? It's amazing. Bill, I love it. I love it. All right. I just want, while Bill plays, I want to give the spirit some space to move. Maybe, maybe you do have that one big thing, that thing that you felt like God couldn't forgive you for. Ooh, that just, that, I don't know what happened there. That one big thing that you felt like God couldn't forgive. You need to take it to him this morning. Ask him to forgive. Maybe you've had a, a you've got a habit. Maybe there's a pattern of sin. Maybe there's something that you just have had trouble shaking that's been a monkey on your back for a long time. And you need to ask God for the help of that life-giving spirit that will help you become more human. Maybe there's a pile of fake dog poop in your life. Do you feel like Satan keeps dragging you over to and shoving your nose in? And so you still feel about this big most of the time. And you need to actually receive and internalize the forgiveness that God promises. Take just a minute. Let God speak to you.
Father, I thank you for your promises in this area. I thank you that you have promised us that you throw our sins as far away from us as the east is from the west. Thank you that you have promised us that you forgive us our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we claim that this morning. And Father, I pray for those in this room who are doing business with God and who are, who are interacting with you, who are maybe receiving forgiveness for the first time this morning for some of these things. Lord, I pray that as they walk through this week, Lord, that they would not allow the enemy to drag them back over to that pile. I pray for freedom from that. Lord, I pray for that person who maybe has felt the, the weight of this monkey in the, in the form of an addiction to some kind of sin. And Lord, I pray for freedom for them as well. I pray that your life-giving spirit would invade those spaces of their lives. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have an absolutely fantastic week. We would love it if you want to join our crew for the prayer walk that's going to be taking place at 1230. Uh, meet down at the health department. If you're planning, if you're new and you're planning on sticking around for River Tree Connect, it's going to take us a few minutes to get everything arranged. So uh, just <coughs> hang out and uh, we'll be starting probably a little bit after 12.